Now you can get Cox Internet and one unlimited mobile line for $80 a month, all with Wi-Fi equipment included and no annual contract. If only getting it all was always that easy. Like having a night out. And getting a good night's sleep. Get it all with Cox. Get Cox Internet and one unlimited mobile line for $80 a month. Visit cox.com slash value. Limited time offer for new customers only. No annual contract means no minimum term agreement and no early termination fees. Additional restrictions apply. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to Mountain Murders Midweek. I'm Heather. And I'm Dylan. Hey, Dylan. How's it going? It's going great. How are you? I'm doing okay. <laughs> that's, that's really, I'm doing okay. That's a really solid answer. The cold weather has finally made its way to us. It's terribly cold outside, and we've had this wet, just nasty, wet rain for a few days. So it's cold and rainy. Oh my gosh. I feel useless. A cold rain is the worst. It, it, it Like I said, I feel useless. Like all I want to do is take a nap. I would honestly rather it be snowing. No than, kidding. Than a cold rain. No kidding. I would rather have some snow as well. I worked outside for years and years of my life. And um, I got to say, uh, any day I would take a snow over a wet rain because... Gosh, it just chills you to your bones. Yeah, well, you know, I guess winter's almost here. Thanksgiving <laughs> is just around the corner. I can't even believe that. Man, it doesn't feel like turkey day. It does not. And we probably won't do anything anyway. Where did this year go? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> just so you know, I'm not cooking turkey. Yeah, you know, that's okay. I don't like turkey. Not I, really. I'm not a huge turkey fan. And, uh, you know, if you got some good gravy, I have to have the gravy. But um, I do like all the fixings of Thanksgiving. Why don't we just have the fixings and not the turkey? Oh, my God. Is that blasphemy? No. All right. So I mean, unless you want it to be. All right. Let's go over some fixings then. Uh, we're going to have a sweet potato casserole. Is that what you want? And a green bean casserole. We can do Is that. Is that a lot of casseroles? It's a lot of casseroles. And some, uh, got some dinner rolls. Okay. And I might just make some gravy anyway. <laughs> How about some mashed potatoes with gravy? <laughs> mashed potatoes with gravy. To go with your sweet potatoes. Yes. What am I missing? Some cra- I never liked cranberry sauce. I we, do. We, we've talked about this before. I do like cranberry. It just seems weird to me. Maybe I'll make a pecan pie. Oh, yeah. And a pumpkin pie. I don't know about that. And a sweet potato pie. Damn, dude. <laughs> you get me fat over here. <laughs> oh, wow. That's all right. We'll go <laughs> I was grocery shopping earlier and noticed they do have all the Thanksgiving trimmings out. It's time, time. I saw There's a uh, lady behind me in line who was buying a gigantic turkey. I saw our folks in our Discord just now talking about the Thanksgivings. So the yeah, Thanksgivings. I can't wait. Are you going to do all the cooking? Uh, I can do some of the cooking. You know, I'll be talking about cooking a lot. I know, and then you don't be doing no cooking. You're lazy. You know that? The day gets away from me. Like tonight, you could have made dinner, but you were like, no, nah, and you just went and got something. After I went to the grocery store. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> For those people. First world problems. All right, Dylan, it is the midweek, and that means we have a true crime recrap for you. Boy, oh boy, it's been a week in true crime. There's a lot going on. I would say the biggest news story of the week is a jury in the small town of Delphi, Indiana, convicted a man of murder on Monday in the 2017 killings of two teenage girls who vanished during an afternoon hike. I am talking about Richard Allen. That is a very straight up murderer's name, don't you think? Well, deliberation stretched into a fourth day before jurors finally found him guilty in the killings of 13-year-old Abigail Williams and 14-year-old Liberty German. The former drugstore worker was convicted of two counts of murder and two additional counts of murder while committing or attempting to commit kidnapping. So 52-year-old Allen faces up to 130 years in prison. His sentencing is set for December 20th. You know, I heard a, re- a recent little tidbit ab- from this trial of something I hadn't heard before um, that allegedly Allen confessed to that he did indeed murder the girls and his intention was to rape them, but a van drove by and it spooked him. 
Yes. So he kind of freaked out. And one of the witnesses, a neighbor who near, lives nearby the creek, and did indeed own a van and uh, reported that he, he did drive, he, he was driving through the area at the, you know, near this time. So now that's a tidbit that only the killer would know, right? I would reckon so, Dylan. Are you, a, you feel 100% that Alan is the murderer of these two poor girls? Here's the thing. There's not a lot of forensic or physical evidence, but there's a lot of circumstantial evidence. And I know people are like, well, I mean, I've seen a lot of folks online who disagree with this verdict. There's no forensic evidence. There's no DNA. I don't think he did it. He's innocent. But come on. Circumstantial evidence is still evidence. And when you have piles of it that right. point to the suspect, I mean, come on. He had supporters outside of the courtroom. I really, I think they, I think they got it right. I do. I think they did too. And of course, one of the defense's um, key arguments was that he was uh, mentally unstable, and that you know you can't trust any of his own words that came out of his. Can't trust a hoe. Don't trust a hoe. You can't trust his conf- multiple confessions to different people or any of that. So. Yeah, it's I really don't... interesting to me that he only started to have like mental issues when he was arrested. I know. Isn't that interesting how that works sometimes? How convenient. That people only have mental competency issues and such when they're thrown in jail and are awaiting a murder trial. Because, you know, it doesn't seem like he had too many problems before. No, no. I think they got the right guy and I hope he rots in hell. Because what, I mean, just that story. And I know that we had the little bit of video and the down the hill and all that kind of got, you know, blown up. But, I mean, at the end of the day, you have two young girls. They were just trying to, you know, have a have a fun afternoon. And, and look what this monster did to them. And it's terrible. Carroll County Prosecutor Nicholas McLeland told jurors in his closing arguments that Allen is the man seen following the girls in a grainy cell phone video recorded by one of them. Um, as they abandoned this rail or crossed this abandoned railroad trestle called the Monon High Bridge, McClellan told jurors Richard Allen is bridge guy. He kidnapped them and later murdered them. And they also believe that Allen's voice was captured on the cell phone video. And I read something about they had like they did a voice test and confirmed it was his voice. Oh, really? But then, of course, his supporters are saying, well, it was such a uh, like, you know, the volume on the video wasn't that great. And they, you know, ran it through all the software and they don't think it's very reliable. So who knows? <sighs> who knows? It, it, it kills me. That, and and I, I think a lot of times these, ho- especially in high profile cases, you have uh, people on both sides. But uh I don't know, you know, I mean. Well, like, okay, like we said, circumstantial evidence piles up, Dylan. And an investigator testified during the trial that Alan told him and another officer that on the day the girls vanished, he was wearing a blue or black Carhartt jacket, jeans, and a beanie. Very similar clothing um, that's seen in German cell phone video of this down the hill guy, this suspect. The bridge guy. I mean, there's some other evidence here, too. Um, supposedly, there was an unspent bullet found between the teens' bodies that had been cycled through Allen's 40 caliber Sig Sauer handgun. And a firearms expert told the jury that her analysis tied the round to Allen's handgun. So even though it wasn't sh- spent, it wasn't shot, if you will, they, they it was leaving uh, characteristics or markings on the shell by being cycled through the through the weapon. But a firearms expert that was called by the defense questioned the state police's bullet analysis and said that um, this was no magic bullet and that it was a comparison of apples to oranges, this um, unspent round to one fired from Allen's gun. Oh, so they're saying there's no way to tell. Well, there's definitely conflicting points of view on that from these experts. And, and man, you know, uh, I, I was watching this doc not long documentary not long ago, and you know, it actually doesn't take a, it doesn't take a whole when you hear okay, so you hear someone put on the witness stand and they're called an expert, 
and you, and you figure that they've been vetted and they truly are an expert in their field or they have all these, you know, all this experience and the degrees hanging on the wall. But, you know, before in the past, there's been people who weren't truly experts, you know, being put forth that, you know, with this type of uh, uh, conflicting uh, testimony. So, yeah, you know, you're, you're up there for the defense. You're putting their spin on it. Same thing for the prosecution. So, you know, sometimes I think that gets a little, a little carried away. I, I mean, how do you say, I didn't do this, when you're admitting you were there, you've made this confession not only to your wife, but to multiple people on multiple occasions. This right. is not an isolated incident. And on top of it, you're admitting that you were wearing something very similar to what the killer had on. I'm just throwing this out there. Let's just say someone dressed in a chicken costume goes on a killing rampage at a local grocery store. Okay. Right? And they have an axe. And then you just so happen to call and say, hey, you know what? I just want to let y'all know I was shopping at the grocery store carrying an axe and wearing a chicken costume very similar to the killer, but I'm not the killer. I mean, are we going to believe that? I guess that's... that's so yeah. we have a lot of men who are built exactly like the bridge guy because Richard Allen looks a whole lot like him, right? A little goatee and all, wearing a damn Carhartt jacket and jeans, and they just so happen to be wearing like the same outfit that day. Right. Were they plan it? Were they color coordinating? The same outfit as a chicken killer. I just don't believe it. I think this guy is guilty, and I think he's where he needs to be. Well, I agree with that, and I hope, hopefully, the family can finally, uh, both families can get a little bit of closure. I mean, never going to feel that hole in their heart, but uh, uh, hopefully, they can. Uh, They've move been through forward. so much. It's been a it's been a minute too. It's, yeah, it's been a really long time. It's been years. It's been what, like eight years? Twenty seventeen. Gosh, right? I can't believe <laughs> time is flying by, man. I can't believe I actually remember. The, where I was and everything when this broke and how long ago that was. And it kind of blows my mind that it's been that long. I can't believe it. I'm just surprised that it's taken this long to catch this person considering they had this cell phone video yeah, I know. footage because it's so rare you get something like that. And, and uh, you know, it was a snippet and it was, uh, you know, wasn't the clearest because she was uh secretly taking the video i think you know and um but most most of the time you don't get that much you don't get any video or audio at all so it's kind of odd that uh, it's taken this long but i gotta say the investigators have been dogged on this and they they've exhausted many different avenues and tips and i think they did their best with this case it was just a tough case Dylan, we have to talk about something wild in California. Oh, wow. Speaking of chicken costumes, <laughs> this is a crime involving a bear costume. Shut up. <laughs> so in Los Angeles County, authorities recently arrested four individuals on suspicion of lying about a bear damaging their vehicle in an insurance fraud scheme. So according to the California Department of Insurance, on January 28th, 26-year-old Ruben Tamanzrian, I think that's how you say it, 39-year-old Arahat Chick... <laughs> Where are these people from? <laughs> Ararat Chirkinian, 32-year-old Vaha... I just give up. Okay, so these four, four these four folks claimed that a bear entered their 2010 Rolls-Royce Ghost in Lake Arrowhead, causing damage to the inside of the vehicle. They provided video footage of the incident to their insurance company, who immediately suspected fraud and reported it to the California Department of Insurance. The Department of Insurance looked into the video and determined the bear was actually a person in a bear costume. <laughs> and there's video footage that they have posted as part of their... I guess their their release, yeah, their press release. Yeah, I saw this earlier today, actually, and um, it's pretty pretty comical because it's it's obviously a person in a costume and not, nowhere near a bear. But why don't you just tell them that four Bigfoot beat your car up? And and this we're talking about a Rolls Royce Ghost, 
This is a very, very expensive car. You know, tens and tens of thousands of dollars, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'm not sure. And uh, I don't know. This was not a really good plan. Well, especially not because detectives learned the suspects made two additional insurance claims with two different insurance companies for the same date and location for a 2015 Mercedes G63 AMG and a 2022 Mercedes E350. And in those claims, they allegedly used a bear costume to fake vehicle attacks and gave the insurance companies video footage to prove their case. God. They even had a California Department of Fish and Wildlife biologist review the footage. And that person also determined that the bear was actually a person in a costume. Detectives executed a search warrant and located the bear costume in the suspect's residence. I'm going to try this one more time. Tamrazian, <laughs> Cherkinian, Murikadenian, and Zuckerman, all from the L.A. area, face charges of insurance fraud and conspiracy. So in total, um, the insurance companies were defrauded of more than $141,000 as a result of these crimes. Who came up with this plan? I mean, seriously, did, and I, what I really want to know is, did you already have the bear costumes and that's how the plan developed? Or did you go out and get bear costumes specifically for this insurance fraud? It's even been labeled Operation Bear Claw. <laughs> oh my gosh. This is one of the dumbest crimes I've ever heard of. Seriously. And then you're going to make video of it and, and not even, yeah. Really good plan, guys. Yeah, it's it's definitely a bunch of knuckleheads. And, and you know, they, they maybe they were smoking pot or something. They was like, man, yeah, man, that'll work. We'll get a man. bear costume. Yeah, <laughs> yeah dude, this will work. A bear bro. attack. My God, dumbasses. I mean, I feel like they would have had more luck if they just could run around stealing picnic baskets or something. A <laughs> picnic basket? Yes. So Dylan, serial killer Charles Manson confessed to murders before he became the leader of the notorious Manson family cult. Chilling new audio from a prison phone call reveals. What? We've been how long we've we been sitting on this audio, folks? I mean, seriously? Well, Peacock has an upcoming docu series called Making Manson, and Manson who died in 2017 says in a phone call from prison, Quote, there's a whole part of my life that nobody knows about. I lived in Mexico for a while. I went to Acapulco, stole some cars. I just got involved in stuff over my head, man. Got involved in a couple of killings. I left my 357 Magnum in Mexico City and left some dead people on the beach. Okay. Now, we all know Manson spent more than 45 years in prison after he was convicted of directing the Manson family clan to kill at least seven people in California in the summer of 1969. This will be an interesting docuseries. It's a three-part docuseries. It's going to dive deep into 20 years worth of never, never before aired conversations in which Manson talks about his childhood, life of crime, and his time as a commune and cult leader. Okay. Now, yeah. I got to say, that does sound interesting, and I'm kind of surprised because, you know, the Manson case has been combed over a bajillion times. <laughs> yes. That's that's all you have to say. That's a lot. A bajillion. Yeah. So at a parole hearing in 2012, it was revealed that Manson had coldly told one of his prison psychologists, quote, I'm special. I'm not like the average inmate. I've spent my life in prison. I've put five people in the grave. I'm a very dangerous man. <laughs> All five foot of him. And also in the mid-2000s, he proudly proclaimed during an interview with the Post, I am crime. And I believe this is the New York Post. I am crime. Wow. Man. He, you know, he was a, he was an entertaining um, you know, I never viewed him as very scary. Were you ever just like, oh my God, he's like the face of evil. Did you ever feel that way about Manson? <laughs> no. Because my, my exposures growing up, 
it always he, he seemed comical and like totally whacked out. You know what I mean? He just looks like a a little feller dipped in hair. Like I would just like <laughs> kick him in his tiny wiener. He was a little feller dipped in hair. That's a very good description of He's just a little hairy thing, a little hairy troll. Yeah, man. Just kick him, like I said, kick him in his tiny wiener. Um, so part of this docuseries has an interview with Manson's former cellmate, a guy named Phil Kaufman, and he will talk about what it was like to live with the killer. I mean, it's just very interesting. I bet it was way too much, and Charlie never had an off switch. The docuseries is premiering on the streaming platform November 19th, so that's coming up pretty soon. I think I need to watch that. I would love to share a very tiny uh, area, a small cell with a person who says things like, I am crime. <laughs> I would just roll him up in his little <laughs> sheet, just tie him to his little bed and leave him there. Oh my gosh. But I will watch this. That sound, does sound interesting. The uh, For some reason, 50 years later, they're still sitting on all, these hours of audio which is pretty amazing. Now we must talk about the story, Dylan. Remember, I believe it was last week, we talked about a murder suspect who escaped Tennessee and was hiding out someplace in South Carolina. Well, he's been captured, and now his wife is also facing charges herself. Uh, aiding and abetting. Authorities in South Carolina charged Taylor and Fiber with accessory and false reporting after... Um, she admitted to helping her husband, Nicholas Wayne Hamlet, hide from authorities. Fiber bought a ticket for her husband to flee Knoxville and then get to South Carolina. Authorities caught up with Hamlet at a Columbia hospital late Sunday night when a staff member recognized his face after seeing him on the news. Um, in this report, Fiber misled investigators, telling them her husband was the brother of the murder victim who was first and incorrectly identified as Brandon Christopher Andrade. Investigators later learned that Hamlet used the Andrade name when calling dispatchers in Polk County about the murder and that he had used the name after the murder during his run from the law. Authorities later found out that Fiber knew her husband was faking this identity and that she knew his real identity. Well, of course, it's her husband. She bought supplies for her husband while he was in hiding she actually went to a sports academy in South Carolina and purchased a gray camping tent, tent and then delivered it to him in the woods where he was hiding out. Now that's real love right there. <laughs> <laughs> would, would you do all this for me, baby? It's a lot of running around. Is it in this weather? Is it cold and rainy? Because if it's cold and rainy... I'm screwed. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're fucked because I'm not leaving the house. I don't blame you. Okay, it's too cold out there. I wouldn't even ask you to. It's a lot. I mean, I don't know what exactly she was thinking. Well, uh, she's lo it's love. You know, you don't think clearly. You, you think with other parts of your body beside your brain. She was thinking with her knees, you know what I'm saying? She was thinking with her dick. <laughs> okay, Dylan, here is a bit of a lighter true crime story, and actually one that I can get down with. Because a man in the United Kingdom was a part of a cheese heist where he stole... $389,000 worth of cheese. <laughs> this guy is my hero. <laughs> so this is either very uh, exclusive high dollar cheese or he stole an entire 18-wheeler trailer of cheese. It's <laughs> it, one or the other. Either way. Now, authorities in London have arrested a 63-year-old man in connection with a cheese heist of 2024 in which tens of thousands of pounds of high-value cheddar were stolen from a major distributor. London-based retailer and cheesemaker Neil's Yard Dairy said it learned on whoa, Wednesday... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Neil's Yard Dairy? Yes. And he works in the cheese business? Yes. That's amazing. So Neil's Yard Dairy learned on Wednesday that a suspect was in custody. Um, the man was detained on suspicion of fraud by false representation and handling stolen goods. He was taken to a South London police station where he was questioned, and he has since been bailed pending further inquiries. So over the past week, the British artisanal cheese community has been reeling after Neil's Yard Dairy announced it was a victim of a sophisticated fraud 
resulting in over $389,000 worth of cheddar. I like how it threw the artisanal cheese community into it. So, this theft involved a fraudulent buyer posing as a legitimate wholesale distributor for a major French retailer with the cheese delivered before the discovery of this fraudulent identity. The thief made off with 950 wheels, which is over 22 metric tons, or roughly 48,500 pounds of cheese. Now, look, I'm kidding around, but this is serious business. This uh, this is, uh, I'm going to assume this cheese was aged probably for a very long time, you know, a lot of times it is, and it's not easily replaced, right? Well, here's the deal. These wheels came from three different artisan suppliers across England and Wales, Hafford, Westcombe, and Pitchfork Cheddar. Between them, these cheeses have won numerous awards and are amongst the most sought-after artisan cheeses in the United Kingdom, the high monetary value of these cheeses likely made them this a particular target, you know, for the thief. So, um, cheddar, which originated in a village by the same name in Somerset, England, is the best-selling cheese in the United Kingdom and is considered a big source of national pride. Last week, British celebrity chef Jamie Oliver explained in an Instagram video that there is only a small handful of real cheddar cheese makers in the world, and that's where the stolen cheeses came from and he oh. called it a real shame oh my gosh i want i want to taste this cheese i know right yes yeah, so if anyone out there listening has ever tasted this cheddar hit us up at Mount murders podcast uh, wait 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 Mount murders podcast at gmail.com i want a wheel of cheese i uh, want 950 wheels of cheese 20 did you say 22 metric tons of yeah. cheese now God, these must be some really big wheels. Um, what are you going to do with the cheese if you steal it? How eat are you going to fence it? I'm going to eat it. Honey, that's, you couldn't eat all that cheese in a lifetime. I'm going to eat it, and then I'm going to celebrate eating it. <laughs> you're just you're just hot away. You know how much cheese I eat? Yeah, yeah. I eat a lot of fucking cheese, dude. We eat a lot of cheese. I love cheese. It's my favorite. Gosh, you're just, uh, just in a dark alley trying to sell wheels of artisan ch- cheddar. Whatever, I'm hiding that cheese out in the basement. My cellar. My cheese cellar. <laughs> you, got, you got a cheese cellar? I would if I stole it. Right. All right, Dylan. Now, here's another strange news story that has been making the rounds this week. Wait a second. We've already had bears cheese people bears tear up cars we've had a a truckload of cheese we have all these oh it's more than a truckload of cheese yeah it's what we call a fuck ton of cheese okay 22 fuck tons of cheese yes and we've had uh these huge revelations about charles manson hours and hours of unaired i mean uh conversations and confessions what what else you got for us this is a huge week in truth. This has uh, been making the rounds. In the and Delphi. It's such a strange story. A Wisconsin father allegedly faked a kayaking accident and has been missing for some months since August. He's actually been discovered in Europe, <laughs> alive someplace. He's just hanging out. Ryan Borgwart was reported missing in August and is now believed to be alive somewhere in Europe. This Wisconsin father, who police believe staged his own disappearance, was in contact with a woman from Uzbekistan and took out a life insurance policy before vanishing. Ryan Borgwart has not been seen by his family or authority since August, when deputies responded to a missing persons call and found his vehicle and trailer in Green Lake County, Wisconsin. When authorities searched Green Lake, um, they found this capsized kayak. The next day, searchers found Bergwort's fishing rod and tackle box in the lake, and inside the box was the man's license, the missing man's license. So he's a married father of three, and he was not located. A 54-day search ensued that involved search dogs, diving teams, but the search went in a different direction in October, when police learned that Borgwart's name had been checked by Canadian authorities a day after he was reported missing, which was something 
they didn't expect. So they did a search of his laptop, which led authorities to to discover that he had replaced his hard drive and deleted his internet browser history the day before he vanished. Authorities later found that he had taken photos of his passport, moved funds to a foreign bank account, changed his email, and had been communicating with a woman from Uzbekistan. Yeah, and these are things that every uh, ordinary citizen does all the time. I don't see what the big deal is. And the months before disappearing, he had taken out a $375,000 life insurance policy. So after all this evidence, authorities realized that maybe he was not in their lake. Well, look, this is messed up. You got people risking their lives to recover uh, your remains for your family or to find out what happened to you. So that's really messed up. And who who wants to get away from their family this bad? And just leave your wife and kids yeah. hanging? Yeah. I mean, this man's kids are like pleading, please, daddy, come home. We miss you. <laughs> and he's in, he's in uh, Somewhere Europe. Somewhere in Europe. Chilling with a chick from Uzbekistan. Doing who knows what. Well, I know what he's not doing. Coming, <laughs> coming <laughs> home to the family. Kayaking. <laughs> Oh, man, I'm going to arrange a kayaking accident to make it look like I'm dead. How fucking dumb are you is what I want to ask this and, guy. And like, are you, what is wrong with you? You were fucking, you were so dumb. Like, you're not going to get caught. And you're going to get the life insurance. Nobody's going to ask you any questions. using your real name to sneak into Canada, get into Canada. I mean, come on. And in, in today's world, you leave a digital trail. Even if you think you've erased your history, it's not really gone. Somebody well, can retrieve it. Yeah, he replaces a hard drive and he uh, deleted his browser history. He thought he he thought he was good to go. What a dumbass! <laughs> it's fucking stupid. <laughs> fucking Ryan. Now we have to talk about this, <laughs> Dylan, because this is another crime story that I can't believe. Are you ready? Uh, yeah, I guess. This has been the day of wacky crimes. So a Georgia mom was stunned when police arrested her after her 10-year-old son walked less than a mile away from home by himself. Dude, I heard about this. I heard about this story. And, and yeah, continue. Brittany Patterson told her story to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and NBC News. And she tells the outlets that she plans to fight a charge of reckless conduct which could land her in jail for up to a year if she's convicted. So what happened was, on October 30th, while Patterson had taken her other one of her other children to the doctor's office, her son Soren left the family's home in Mineral Bluff, Georgia, and went into town. Patterson was notified when the sheriff's office called to tell her where her son was. Now, she's saying it's not a super dangerous area, the stretch of road at all isn't dangerous and that she was not at all worried or concerned for his safety. This is a town of less than 400 people, folks. And, and the town is was a, around a mile away from the home, okay? This is the kind of community where everybody knows your name. If somebody drives by and they see somebody's kid, they, they likely know whose kid it is. And so some woman sees this younger kid walking down the road and pulls over and says, hey, are you okay? Kid's like, yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Keeps on about his business. Well, she takes it upon herself. And I'm going to I'm gonna venture a guess that this is someone not from the area. This is a transplant or something like that. Maybe I'm wrong. A busybody. A busybody. She takes it upon herself to call the police anyway and tell them about this kid walking down the road by themselves. This was not a, a strange occurrence when I was younger. Not at all. This is what kids did. Yeah. They were outside. They were kicking it. They were going all over the place in the neighborhood or down the country road. It didn't matter to where. To a friend's house. To, to a, the store. To the store. To I mean, I remember many a time walking down the road, like from my house <laughs> yeah. to the store. Yeah. To buy a popsicle. Or a beef jerky, because, oh man, back they had those beef jerkies that were like in the plastic, like the big plastic container. Oh, you yeah. You like reach in and get one, and they're like, really, those are the best, dude. <laughs> they're the driest. Yeah. Um, no, it wasn't a strange, and I, I'd be gone from home for hours, hours, like I was putting in a work day. 
<laughs> you putting in a work day, huh? And so, and so the you not, was playing. The authorities come back after the fact, after they made contact. Right. So with what her. happened? What happened was, Soren was driven home by deputies and apologized for this miscommunication with his mom. She thinks this is the end of the ordeal, but then officers return and put her in handcuffs. She was arrested in front of her son, was taken to jail. They made her change into an orange jumpsuit, and they finally released her on a $500 bond. This blows me away. This really blows me away. And when they're harassing regular parents like this, there's some kid out there who needs needs their help. That's the case every time. Well, according to these news outlets, authorities tried to get Patterson to sign a safety plan, which would require her to make sure her children were under constant watchful, like under a constant watchful eye. And she said she would not sign the form and was going to fight this charge because she says she didn't do anything wrong. There's been a GoFundMe set up to raise money for her. $40,000 has been raised. Okay. Patterson's attorney, David DeLugas, told NBC, quote, are all parents going to have to put GPS on their child? The parents get to decide for their children unless it's unreasonably dangerous. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, another part of the safety plan was forcing her to download an app on her son's phone so they could track him all the time. This, this is a this, this is, is an overreach. This is a definite overreach of local authority. And I don't know why they kind of key in on people sometimes like this, but I, I'm sorry, I don't agree at all. I don't think they have the authority. I don't think that uh, I don't think there was any negligence in this case. And, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we just come from a different time. But I don't hear anything in this uh, story that makes me think this child was being neglected, ignored, or in danger of any sorts. Oh, I mean, like you said, Dylan, we would go riding bikes. We would be miles from home. We would be outside playing all day. For hours. In the woods. Our yeah. parents didn't know where the hell we were. We were probably up to some nonsense. No no cell phones. No. No. Yeah. You would get dropped off at the pool all day by yourself. Yeah. I mean. Three bucks for the concession yeah, stand. Yeah. Have fun. And you had a blast. I mean, hell, I was like watching my little cousins when I was like 11 years old. I mean, not for hours, but you know what I mean? I was even like babysitting at that time. Right. Not much older than this kid. So what the hell? I don't know. I really think that this is going to go nowhere. No, it's going to go it's gonna nowhere. It's going to get thrown out of court. And what kills me is in situations like this, uh, how the, uh, the powers that be, whoever they are, even locally, will push it and push it. And not let it go. And not drop it. But you can go sit in court all day long and watch them make deals with criminals and not put them in jail. Yeah. People so, who, like, need <laughs> to be in jail. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Have you heard the story, Dylan, about the 35 escaped monkeys in, Cal in, Cal in South Carolina? Yeah, they're right down the road <laughs> from us. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So from what I'm understanding here, about eight of the monkeys are still at large. The others have been recovered. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes. But they uh escaped from a research, a research yeah. facility. And this is terrifying because I'm like, have you guys not seen how Outbreak starts? The movie Outbreak? Uh from a monkey getting out of a research facility. Yeah. Man, that movie terrified me as a young person patrick dempsey fucked everybody in that movie by getting the breaking the monkey out oh yeah yeah, yeah i forgot he was in that inning. it was him well i i just remember was it renee russo yeah she's hot i would motorboat her you like renee russo dude i think she's hot yeah okay she's super hot she's pretty hot yeah i know that's what i just said <laughs> <laughs> No, but uh, so, uh, for okay, first thing I need to know when this story breaks is, A, what were you researching? That, look, that, that's that's the first sentence in this report. But, so they were at the Alpha Genesis Primate Research Center. That does what? In Yamasee? Yemis, <laughs> Why do I always get stuck with these places I can't pronounce? Because I'm country. 
These primates, some of them have been successfully recovered. They all appear to be in good health. 25 of the escaped monkeys were captured safely over the weekend. A group of the monkeys had amassed along the facility's fence line, where many had bedded down for sleep overnight. Police in the town about 60 miles west of Charleston urged neighbors to be vigilant and keep their doors and windows closed and secured. (laughs) Yeah, you'd hate to have to total your car if a bunch of monkeys get in it and destroy it. Well, a caretaker failed to lock two uh, new enclosures doors, feeding and cleaning the, the area, and that seems to be how they escaped. And... They, uh, I'm sorry, Alpha Genesis, they provide non-human primate products and bio-research services. Um, Some of the monkeys are used to aid uh, research into brain disease disorder treatments. Yeah, see, that that's called zombies. Yeah, that's okay. called outbreak. <laughs> zombie monkeys. And now we're all going to end up with the zombie monkey disease. I mean... I'm not going to lie. I did have that on my 2024 bingo card. No, but... Uh, it just keeps getting stranger in, out here. In reality, these union uh, these monkeys were trying to unionize, and they just wanted fair representation in the workplace. <sighs> well, I don't really like animal testing. I don't like that part. But I, I think, suppose maybe it's necessary in some cases. I think I we know. should do all experimentation to further human uh, medical research on death row inmates. You think so? Yeah. So according to the Alpha Genesis CEO, the employee at the center of the monkey escape walked off the job and has not returned. (laughs) Can you imagine this? This person is like, oh shit, oh shit, I really messed up, dude. (laughs) It's calling his friends. Well, their understanding is that immediately after this incident occurred, the employee's supervisor approached her and stated that she could be terminated if it was determined that there was no structural failure, which led to this escape. There wasn't. The enclosure was new and it was in perfect working order. And at that point, the employee walked off the job and didn't return. Okay. Well, you know what? They don't have any plans to release the employee's name. She read the writing on the wall. And she's like, you're not going to fire me. I'm going to quit. So, yeah, what now? South Carolina Congresswoman Nancy Mace launched an inquiry into the facility on Wednesday. Her office has demanded a full briefing from the NIH and USDA about active contracts and inspections at the facility, documentation of communication with Alpha Genesis regarding the recent monkey escape, and immediate corrective actions to enhance oversight and safety at Alpha Genesis. Okay. Mace, Representative Mace, says this facility has a disturbing history of animal welfare violations and has received tens of million dollars in taxpayer funding. Damn. And that they want to get to the bottom of what's actually going on. This is not the first time primates have escaped. Well, look, primates are going to be hard to keep up. They got opposable thumbs, right? And they all just want to go find the man in the yellow hat. They want some bananas. Curious, George. They want to swing all nimbly, bimbly like from limb to limb. Did you ever trust the man in the yellow hat? We've talked about this before. I I don't know. Have we had this conversation? Yeah, because we talked about how I thought he was creepy. You know, as a kid, I guess I didn't really think about it. I always just thought George was kind of annoying. Yeah. Like, even as a kid, I would think, like, get somewhere and get still. Yeah, George. Why are you always into some shit? I know, man. Like, what an annoy! Like, you would get on my nerves, George. Just hang out, bro. Those monkeys kind of freak me out. Monkeys terrify me. Like, I don't really want a pet monkey. I mean, I see them sometimes on TV, and it's like, oh, look, it's wearing a little diaper. That's kind of cute. But then, you know, they kind of weird me out. They seem mean. Yeah, I know. That's what I think. They seem mean, and like they could at any moment rip my eyeball out and eat it, <sighs> or attack me, or eat my face. All right, I guess that brings us to the end <laughs> of a wacky week of true crime news. It's been cheesy, Dylan. <laughs> oh, it's been cheesy. And now I'm going to get out. We're going to get off here and we're going to make some grilled cheeses. Oh, I don't want a grilled cheese. I only wish I had I just that. Eat the cheese. I had that artisan cheddar from the UK. Wow. I know, right? Sounds tasty. 
Do you have a favorite cheese? You don't have a favorite anything. No. I don't know if we've talked about this with our listeners, but you cannot ask Dylan, like, what's your favorite anything, like movie, music, food. He cannot choose a thing, no. a favorite thing. I can't. He, like, he absolutely cannot. It's, it's not that I don't want to or I'm just trying to be that guy who's different. It's not true. I, I literally can't. Like, I shut down. I had to do like top threes, top fives. You do. It's weird. What's your favorite cheeses? What's your favorite cheese? Do you have a favorite? No. Gosh, I mean. Which are your favorites? See, I don't even remember all the names and stuff like you do. You know, I like the Havarti's and the Cheddar's and the, I like all cheeses. You like Irish part. Cheddar. I like our, oh, love Irish Cheddar. Well, I, but I, I'm more of a, um, I don't want the sweet. I want it to be cheesy. You don't really like soft cheeses. I don't care for soft I've cheese. I've noticed, like, when I have brie, you're not a big fan. No. You don't really like it. I don't care for brie. I've noticed. I don't like it. I love Stilton. It's expensive, but I love it. What does it do? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what it do in my mouth. What it be like? <laughs> Delicious. Is it is it sweet? Salty? Mm-hmm. Savory? Kind of a it's not a sweet cheese. Okay. But it's not like a hard cheese either. I guess Ooh. it's kind of in the middle. Damn. Though I like the Stilton with the dried apricots on it. That's my favorite. Oh, my cheese packing a gat and a bandana sign. Damn. Hard. <laughs> you like your cheese hard? <laughs> yeah. Straight up gangsta. <laughs> That's it. Dang. All right. So, gosh, now I want some cheese. Now you got me feeling like there's a block of cheddar riding around in like an El Camino and it might shoot me. <laughs> Until I break yourself, fool. Ah! <laughs> oh, thank you for that, Heather. Thank you for that uh, true crime recap. And uh, I got to say thank you for everything. And folks, hang on to your drawers. Oh, man. Heather is oh, man. working on a case. We're not even sure we can talk about it. This is one of the most insane, crazy stories she has ever come across, hands down. She can't even wrap her head around it's it. It's true. All I can say is it is the most dysfunctional story and has so many different elements of crime. Yeah. And there will be a major trigger warning at the beginning because <sighs> it's like so many things that could upset someone. Right. It's fucking nuts, dude. <sighs> Okay, I can't wait to talk about it, though, <laughs> oddly enough. And, uh, yeah, until next time. Maybe a two-parter. Okay. Because this is, I mean, telling you, dude, is such a wild story. I'm going to go rest my brain and get ready for this week's Mountain Murders. Bye, Dylan. Bye.